like rocking the fucking affliction you know yeah. fucking t-shirts and shit and like I, um, I, I get it. One. I had an affliction shirt because dude, I, no, no shame in that. That was that was the time, you know. That was the time to rock them. But I had um, like a sixty dollar Vladimir Klitschko shirt. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I wore it one time and I was like, "This is stupid. I gotta." Dude, take yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Sean, Sean's a smart dude because he's like been bringing that crowd over that like for like so many years. Like sort of pop culture was like not exposed to like. MMA, so he's like kind of merging both things, and like he's friends with like Takashi Six Nine and like, mm-hmm. um, you know Logan and, and Jake he's Paul and shit. Worlds. It's like for him, yeah. I, and, and we talked to him. I was like, what you're what you're doing for yourself at such a young age, twenty seven, right? So like, what he's doing for himself at such a young age, setting himself up for you can only fight for so long, right? You're not yeah. going to be here fifty years old fighting, forty years old fighting. He's setting himself up for the future, and where he can just be like. Yeah, I do Twitch streams, I got YouTube, I got money coming yeah. residually through all that. I know he's in cannabis. Like the dude's got everything going for him and he's such a lightning rod of a personality, especially when he's in the ring. Like it's it's a really cool thing to see. And I, I remember when I was working with Ariel early on 2017, when Ariel came over to ESPN, and I started seeing like who's this kid? Like he's like very I don't know, like, like, he, there's something appealing about him. Yeah. And it was like, all right, this kid's really good. Like, he's a really good striker. He's knocking people out. Like, that's that's something that the UFC really wants to see. And then all of a sudden, he's turned into who he's turned into. Yeah, hundred percent. And like, you get all these like young kids like coming to the UFC, and they're just like boss saws. They're like, I want to fight the toughest guy right now. And like, you see them not always, but oftentimes shorten their careers because of that because they're just one challenge after challenge after challenge. Sean O'Malley's really kind of patient and and taking his time. And that comes with some hate. Obviously, some people are like, yo. This guy's not getting tested, this and that, but uh, he's been doing it right, man. He's been blowing up and and just sort of, you know, step by step, not skipping a step. And uh, I, I guess this is the biggest step, right? UFC 276. So Absolutely. Speaking of that, Danny Segura from USA Today Sports. Um, tell everybody where they can find you, what they can do. This is the first time that we've had something like this. We're breaking down the card. You and I went to school together. We, we know each other from back in the day. Reconnected through our, through our mutual friend, Ariel Hawani. Um, we're going to be breaking down UFC 276. It's going to be a monster card. And we can start right there with Sean O'Malley, Pedro Munoz. Like, what do you think of this fight? You said uh, Sean hadn't been tested. And I would agree he's been fighting kind of the the fish that they feed him. Like, as a dolphin, it's like, all right, here, you can just have this one and have this one. But he hasn't really gone onto the water and, and gotten dragged out into the deep. Is Pedro Munoz that guy? Yeah, 100%. I mean, Pedro Munoz, just a few months ago, he was ranked in the top five of the UFC's bantamweight division. And uh, he's lost some fights, for sure. He's one and four in his past five. But four of those losses came against uh, the current champion or former champion. So we're talking about Dominic Cruz, Jose Aldo, Aljamin Sterling, and Peter Yan, if I'm not mistaken. So it's like, dude, the type of guys that he's facing is like top level. And all those fights, all those defeats, all came with a fight night bonus. So it's not like he's getting murked. He's giving them tough fights. He's giving them very, very competitive outings. So this is this is a big step. And and look, the UFC for the most part, they they're good at identifying for the most part. Every now and then they'll miss a guy like Masvidal who went his entire career without being a star, and all of a sudden he explodes very late on when he had all those materials to explode. You know, way back when. But uh, that's a different topic for a different day. But with O'Malley, they kind of identified him. Okay, this is the next star. So they'll give him the floaties. They'll they'll put him first of all in, in the four feet water, this and that. And then you know as he gets more comfortable, they'll take some stuff away. They'll push him a little deeper. And this is it, man. We are really looking at one of the most crucial moments of his career. This is where the UFC takes off all those floaties, throw him in the deep end. Let's find out if you can swim or not. The UFC can only do so much in you know nurturing these prospects. But at the end of the day, they're gonna push you to the deep end at some point in your career. To find out whether you sink or swim and that's what we're gonna find out at ufc 276 pedro muñoz is as experienced as they come he is he's never been knocked out in the ufc and he's been Crazy. fighting bossa after bossa he's tough as hell very good jiu-jitsu i mean this is a tough tough test for sean o'malley and we'll, we'll find out we'll find out we'll see if he's the real deal this is definitely and it the good thing about the good thing about sean is that he creates the narrative for himself in such a great way, right? He's he's very Conor McGregor, and he said as much. I want to be better than Conor McGregor. I think I'm better than Conor McGregor as a as an artist, right? Like we can call him that as an entertainer. Like the way that he can build a narrative 
and call out guys in the division. Like nobody's really called him out, right? Like nobody ahead of him has called him out and said, all right, bring me sugar. I want to fight him, whatever. Like, I think there's a certain respect within the Bantamweight division, even though he has been fighting guys that are lower ranked, they see five straight knockouts. Like that's something that just doesn't happen from, oh yeah, this guy's okay. He's the 12th rank, 13th rank, whatever. And like, he's just knocking everybody out. So to, to you and, and your expertise, like this fight goes to Suga if what happens? So I think, you know, we talk about, I mentioned how the UFC is kind of walking him or like aiding him and giving him all these tools and kind of setting him up for success, right? But at the end of the day, he has to do his part as well. He has to pull his own weight. And this matchup within all the top guys you can give him in the top 10, Pedro Munoz, I would say, is one of the better matchups for him in the sense that he didn't get a Mirab really that's going to wrestle him and push him against the cage. He didn't get that. He's going to get a guy that's going to come, give him the fight. He's a little bit wild. Sometimes Pedro Munoz um, puts entertainment over victory. Sometimes he's just bloodthirsty and he wants to go out there and, and put on a show and bang. And that's where I think this favors Sean O'Malley. I think within all those wild openings that we see from Pedro Munoz, someone that's nonstop, that's when his accuracy comes in. So as long as he's able to take some damage and wear it well, because Pedro Munoz is going to touch you up. He's going to touch you up. There's no doubt about that. But as long as he's able to withhold and withstand some damage, I think his precision and I think his level of striking and his range should carry him over to a decision. So that's the big question for me. And this is why this matchup, I'm kind of on the fence about it. Because the only time that we saw Sean O'Malley get in some trouble and hurt and respond to adversity was against Chito Vera. And he ended up getting right. TKO'd, knocked out. And a lot of people are saying, well, his foot, man, like this hard to fight like that. But if you look at elite fighters... Mo not, I'm not saying most of them, but what dif dif like what the difference between elite fighters and some other fighters is that they do overcome that. That thing happened to Michael Chandler over in Bellator when he fought Brett P Primus defending his title. He saw the end of the round and he wanted to go out and fight a second, but the doctor said, your legs messed up. You can't go out. But he managed to survive. Serious Henry Cejudo, that happened to him when he fought uh, Marlon Moraes for the vacant UFC bantamweight title. He recovered, came back, and stopped him and won the belt. Jimmy Crute versus Anthony Smith. Again, that fight was stopped, but he went to his stool, and it was the doctor that stopped him. Sean O'Malley wasn't able to really figure it out and was en ended up getting knocked out against Chito Era. So that's my biggest thing here, whether or not he's going to be able to withstand damage. And I think some fighters, Henry Cejudo mentioned it, is he, is he tough? Is he durable? Because if you're not durable, you're not going to last in the top. You could be very skilled. You could be very smart. But... At the end of the day, every single fighter, anything that they have in common from all the top fighters is durability as far as like the top five, top 10 fighters. So um, that's the question. I think, can Sean O'Malley's body hold up against Pedro Munoz? Because skill wise, from what we've seen, he should be able to, to fare here against Pedro Munoz, in my opinion. It's kind of like all great athletes, right? Like everybody's fighting hurt. Everybody's playing hurt, right? Steph Curry in, in the NBA Finals. Yeah ankles hurt here clay thompson the knees hurt this is hurt like everybody who's a champion ends up finding a way to push through that's, exactly that's yeah that's an interesting point like that's something that i don't think people are thinking of is if sean really hasn't been touched up like that outside of cheeto really ever can you can you think of another time that he's gotten like really taken down and been like oh wow like this is not looking good five straight knockouts yeah. like he's been playing with people so for him to yeah show it's been clean take a punch that's big yeah, it's been clean performances all around. The only fight that was kind of tough was, was against Andre Sukuntaj very early, which he had that sort of famous uh, post-fight interview where Joe Rogan interviewed him laying down because he couldn't stand up because his leg was banged up. And I think Nick Diaz went on Twitter and like called him, you know, basically said he was a wimp or, or whatever. I don't know. Can we curse in here? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. He, he's like, oh, this guy's a pussy. So, so it's like, okay, Sean, we know you got the skills, but something that cannot escape. Something that's just universally true. All the top fighters, something that they share in common is toughness and durability. Just look at uh, on the same card, Max Holloway and Volkanovski. Look how tough Warriors. they are. Warriors. I mean, you go against Jared Cannonier, Israel Adesanya. I mean, you can't be a champion in the UFC and, and be, you know, a, a wimp, be weak for, you know, a pussy for lack of a better word. Like, you have to be tough. You have to be tough. And look, some bodies hold up more than others. You know this. You've been covering sports for, for a while. Um, there's just some people that genetically are more prone to injury. There's just some people that genetically just can't 
withstand the same amount of damage, the same about the same amount of hurt to the body as others. So um, it might not even be Sean O'Malley's fault. So again, there's questions surrounding. I think it's too early to like give a verdict on on his body on whether or not he can fare as far as physically speaking. But um, but there's questions there for sure. I made a bet with Sean O'Malley saying that if he knocked out Pedro Munoz, that I would copy his hairstyle and I would get purple cornrows in his honor. So I'm very interested to see what's going to happen in that fight. Um, one, just give me one name who comes out. Oof, I've been going back and forth on this one. I'm going to go... I'm going to go O'Malley. I'm going to go O'Malley, but I have questions, man. I have okay. questions. And honestly, I, I just want to go with O'Malley because I want to see you with the purple corn, <laughs> corn at this point. So go O'Malley. I'm team O'Malley right now. He's got to knock him out, though. He's got to knock him out. That's, All right. Well, was, Pedro Munoz has never been knocked out, but you never know. That's why That's why I knew I knew that I had some things in my favor. I was like, okay, yeah, he yeah. hasn't been knocked out. If O'Malley knocks him out, he deserves for me to have the purple corn runs. Um, yeah. Moving on to a fight that I think is super underrated on this card. Obviously, you've got... The star power with O'Malley. Obviously, you got the co-main event and the main event for title shots. But Sean Strickland versus Alex Pereira, like that's that's a fight that's really really interesting. Can you tell people why? Yeah. So I guess there are so many layers, but the biggest layer is that this Alex Pereira guy, who really is only like five or six fights deep into his professional MMA career, you would never see a guy with this much experience in MMA be fighting this level of opposition, be in these sort of prestigious cards, be this high up the main card. But he is because he has two wins over the guy that's main eventing and, de and defending his title in the main event of this card. So he's knocked out one time and beat by decision as well, um, Israel Adesanya over in kickboxing. Crazy. So it is, it is crazy because you know, this guy that all of a sudden, you know, was a champion in two, two weight divisions in glory and kick, in kickboxing, very prestigious organization, now switches to MMA. UFC is like, okay, there might be a storyline here. Let's sign him. And he's been winning. Granted, they've given him some favorable matchups, as they should. But the guy still, again, lived up to his end, picked up some good victories, some solid knockouts on the way as well. And now he's fighting Sean Strickland, who is easily a top five guy in the division. So if he does beat him, I mean, there's no denying that he's next for the title. And the odds are that according to the odds makers, Israel Adesanya should defend his belt against Jared Cannonier. So that sets itself up for a fantastic fight. Uh, first time in MMA, but trilogy in combat sports in general. So um, there's history there and, and there's bad blood. If you look at the interviews, they've been talking smack in, in the lead up, obviously very focused on their fights, but there, there's something brewing there for sure. And you definitely know that Izzy wants his pound of flesh because he thinks that those two fights shouldn't have gone the way that they went. And Obviously, we can we'll talk about Izzy at length in a couple minutes. But like, to me, I think Israel Adesanya is, is one of the best pound for pound best fighters that I've ever seen from the the neck up. Like his mentality when he goes into the octagon is second to none. I, I don't think I've anybody I've seen anybody so mentally tough when he walks into the octagon. And to know that a guy is out there, you know, with a two zero victory on his record books against you that must make him crazy he's like i'm such a better fighter now than i was back then and now you're going into my territory right he's got what, six fights in the uf uh undefeated the ufc right now two and oh in the ufc five and one so far in MMA. like the fact that he's even on the same card israel's like okay we gotta we gotta show out here so they can bring this guy to me throw him in the water and i'll take him out deep so it's a, it's a really interesting storyline i don't know if people are as excited for that fight outside of the storyline of Izzy versus versus Alex Pereira. I, I, I yeah, I, I mean, a really good fighter too, and he gets lost in this, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, no, I think that's obviously the main storyline, and something that it is worth noting. Um, if you just look at the Wikipedia record, you go, "Oh, this guy beat Izzy twice, one by knockout, one by decision." Like, what else do you want? He's clearly better, right? But if you look at actually the fight itself, where Israel Adesanya gets knocked out, he was piecing up Pereira, man. Like, it was pretty clear who was the better fighter there, at least in that night specifically. And then he gets caught, he gets knocked out. So that has to be getting at him. Like, dude, everybody's out here saying, like, "Oh, this guy's so much better. He knocked me out," but if you actually Actually look at the tape is like eh, you know but but it's definitely interesting i think also getting a little bit forgotten in all this is sean strickland dude like sean strickland is 
he's a weird anti-establishment character, non-PC, a PR nightmare for the UFC in some ways. Um, but at the same time, his personality is completely opposite from what he actually shows in the ring. Sometimes we see like, you know, some crazy guy, you know, in interviews and this and that and fights crazy. But Strickland is completely the opposite. Inside the cage, he might say some stuff. He might look a little crazy, but he fights so composed. He fights so calculated, so smart. Um, this guy's very, very good. And I think he could surprise people. I I'm actually surprised he's the underdog, a heavy underdog entering this fight. Do you think that if Strickland beats Beta, that he's next in line for a title shot? Yeah, he has to be. He has to be. I mean, who else? Who else would it be? Uh, I know Robert Whitaker gave him a tough fight, but I think Robert Whitaker, even though he's Probably former no, champion, see you later. bro, I'll yeah, he's got to put some wins under his belt. Yeah, who, who else would be out there? I mean, Sean Strickland is is definitely number one, unless Israel Desanya wants to give a shot to uh, light heavyweight again and see what he can do against Jiri Prochaska, which that would be an amazing fight. No um, and I like his odds against him. I, I don't see anyone else sort of uh, skipping Pereira. I mean, sorry. Um, Strickland. I think Strickland, if he wins, he's bound to get a title shot. And that's going to be an interesting fight, too. Love it. Who do you got? I'm going to go with Strickland. I'm going to go with the underdog. I think if you I look like at Pereira, it. great striker, great knockout, but he has holes, man. He, he does have a lot of deficiencies, especially in the grappling. I think with somebody like Sean Strickland, who's such a veteran, he's been everywhere. I mean, he was just here in South Florida training at American Top Team just a few weeks ago. The guy has seen it all. And I think... Even though his attack and his style is, is primarily developed on the feet, he's going to mix it up. He's going to want to mix it up. And Pereira has such big deficiencies on the ground that I don't think is going to take him. You know, he doesn't have to go train with Bo Nickel, All-American for like a year in order to, you know, take this guy down. No, like, you know, I think if he, if he does a good game plan, he should take this fight. Um, MMA casuals, UFC casuals want fights to stay on their feet. I don't think that that's something that's overblown. I think people, I think realistically, the UFC wants to see a lot of fights yeah. stay on their feet for the knockout power, for just what we go to UFC for, which is stand-up fighting. Um, that's why it's always been tough for me. Like when when Colby fought George, it was like, like, uh, like okay, well, it's, we're not wrestling here. This isn't Greco-Roman wrestling. I get it. He's a far superior uh, grappler. And George is not a guy that's going to want to sit and fight and, and fight on the ground. In these kind of fights, like I'm just looking through the card here, like O'Malley Munoz, standing. Strict yep. Pereira, hopefully standing. Holloway Volkanovski, standing. Israel Desanya Kennedy, standing. Like these are these are fights that are set up to bring the most bang for your buck when you buy that pay per view. Because last, I mean, obviously. The, the fighters make the card, right? But the last couple of cards, there's been some fights that have been like, eh, okay. Yeah. Like, I don't even want to talk about the Rose Nama Yunus, Carlos Barza one. That one gave me, like, heart palpitations, and I was just very upset. But the point yeah. is that these these next couple fights um, on this card are really going to be good. And Max Holloway, Volkanovski. Bro, Robbie Lawler, Brian Barberina, Brad Riddell, oh, Jalen yes. Turner. I mean, dude. Yes. I, this I, this I, card's I, stacked, dude. I'm looking down here, Brad Tavares. I always have trouble. Drikis Brad Tavares, yeah. Um, Drikis du Duplissis. Yeah. Drikis My Duplissis. Brother. That guy's I'm a prospect, saying, man. Keep an eye on him. So I don't know. I'm just trying to. Yeah. He, he, no, this... he was he was dropped from the last card, too, because I think he got hurt. He was supposed no, to he was supposed to fight Kelvin Gastelum, I think. That's what it was. Or he Somebody stepped up in short order to fight him. And, and yeah, Kelvin Gastelum had to pull out, and then that fight just. That's fell through all you know all together yeah but he he's a good guy and this car's just stacked man um ian gary's a good prospect then you got yeah. the veterans jim miller donald cerrone going at it um it. uriah hall he's a great striker fighting a very good jiu-jitsu guy named andre muniz um this this card stacked dude from the prelims the main card very good card co-main event featherweight championship trilogy volkanovsky alexander volkanovsky versus max blessed holloway and i i'm very torn even though i'm not i'm very torn in this fight right because so as part of DraftKings, i submit our parlay that gets boosted um for all of our ufc events for the mma hangout and obviously this is not news to anybody parlays are really hard to hit just on face value right and yeah. for this one i've got o'malley 
I've got Volkanovski defending the title, and I've got Izzy defending the title. So those okay. are three. You can check the link later on. We'll tweet that out. Make sure that you. Can I like that parlay. I do too, but I always get screwed somehow. So I'm torn here because Volkanovski is just such a powerhouse in the featherweight division. And the last time that we saw Max really be that guy was a long time ago. Was a long time ago. And I just got back from Hawaii and I saw a mural of Max Holloway in Honolulu and I was like, oh shit. I was like, let me check. And then I realized, oh my God, he's fighting July 2nd. He's fighting on UFC 276, trying to get his featherweight you know, title back. And so a piece of me, not you know, coming back from Hawaii, it's like, I would kind of like to see that because they love him in Hawaii. But is Volkanovski just too too good, too strong, too too good, like just such a better fighter now than Max? This is a very close fight. I think this is one of the closest fights in on the card. And honestly, like historically speaking, this is one of the best fights. This is probably the most important fight we've ever seen at featherweight in featherweight history in mixed wow. martial arts. This fight is huge. And as far as just the overall context of title fights, this is up there as well. Like we're talking about two guys that are in the top 10 of pound for pound rankings. Like not often you get two guys that are in the top 10 pound for pound facing each other. So this is huge. And not only that, but I, I think especially more for Volkanovski, he could very well become the featherweight goat if he wins as well. So this has legacy for both guys. I think this is a very, very highly contested fight. I think it would be a lot closer, at least for me mentally, if we were fresh off that Kelvin Cater fight that Max Holloway looked absolutely stupendous. I mean, he was just looking, he was giving um, Cater in that fight basically like lessons. He'd be like looking at the commentary and just jabbing him. I mean, what the guy was doing was just surreal. But then he goes and fights Jair Rodriguez. And Jair Rodriguez, you know, that tough Mexican dude gave yeah. him a, a, a big, big fight, a tough fight. Pieced him up bad, bad enough where he had to go to the hospital immediately after. I mean, both guys did. Um, but in that fight, something that I noticed was that Max Holloway came in there saying, look, I'm the best uh, boxer in MMA. I'm the best best boxer in UFC. But if it wasn't because of his wrestling, he would have lost that. Jair Rodriguez was piecing him up on the feet and he had to use the wrestling to win the fight. And again, fair game. It's mixed martial arts. He is the better fighter. I'm not saying that, you know, because he used the wrestling, that's some sort of coward's way out. No, not at all. He is the better fighter, 100%. But can he take down Volkanovski? Can he tie him up the way he did against Jaid? I don't think so. And Volkanovski, look at the last fight against Korean Zombie. He's just made leaps in his striking. So I wanted them to throw in the towel like half of the It was bad, man. Like, it was this bad. Is not, this is not working. We got to get it out. Bro, that, that's, one of, that's one of those fights where you go, bro, que pena, bro. Que yes, pena. Yes, like, exactly, exactly. You just feel bad, bro. He's such a good guy, right? And, Amazing. And He's so cool. And Volkanovski, I, I feel like I saw through the screen him feeling bad, going, all right, here's a leg kick, pa, here's a punch up, pa, and it's just like he had no answer for Volkanovski whatsoever. Yeah. He's like, I just got to keep punching him until they call it. So, like, yeah. I think Volkanovski's in just such great form right now, too, that, like you said, this is the biggest fight in featherweight history because if think about the arc of Max Holloway's career where he has all these records, right? I'm looking at it now. Record for most wins in the UFC featherweight history at 18. Most finishes at featherweight at 10. Most strikes landed at 2,700. Longest win streak at 13. Like, he, he if, if Volkanovski didn't exist, Max Holloway is one of the greatest fighters of all time and for sure the best featherweight of all time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Aldo set that bar. Like, he's definitely the GOAT. But then you got these two other guys underneath him, Volkanovski and Holloway, competing for that spot. And they're getting close, man. They're getting close. They got the title defenses. They both have wins over Aldo as well, which that helps as well. Um, so this is, yeah, this is a, a huge, huge fight. So hold on. So this fight for you is the one that takes whoever wins over Aldo. Because right now you I, have Aldo as GOAT. I have all those goat because he's got seven title defenses and he was just so dominant, so just an dispatching people. He's an animal. He's an absolute animal. And I, and I think when people say, oh, well, Max Holloway beat him twice, but it's like, okay, well, BJ Penn, one of the greatest fighters to ever exist, also lost to Dennis Seaver towards the end because he just kept fighting and fighting and fighting. Does yeah. that mean Dennis Seaver's the goat? No, that's not how MMA math works. But it does add a little bit to it, right? So in my opinion, I feel like the goat conversation is, is very much a feel. So like, it's not really math. So I have to wait and see what the fight looks like, what the result is, and and see what the feel is, man. And see see if he's got that, that goat feel or not. You know what I'm saying? But I think it's possible. I think right now, undoubtedly, Aldo's the goat. 
But I think if Volkanovski wins, he would have a win over Aldo, uh, three wins over Max Holloway, um, 22 fight winning streak, four title defenses at featherweight. So I think there's an argument there and a conversation to be had about reevaluating who is the GOAT. 22 straight victories. Like, bro, last time he stopped, he's only lost time. once. And that was in 2013, bro. He's undefeated in the UFC, Ten just fighting shark ago. after shark. 10 years was the last time he lost. Like, yeah. It, it almost doesn't make sense. But to that point, like, with all those things, I think if Max, if Max can find a way to beat Volk, like, that all of a sudden turns the entire narrative of his, of his career like 180 degrees like this is somebody who was one of the best fighters continued and all of a sudden was like mm, had a little bit of a dip and then beat the guy who's probably one of the best fighters we've ever seen in any pound for pound you know weight class it's a really it's it's a, it's a really exciting fight yeah this fight is is awesome for me this is the main event of the card i mean this fight is just historic it's huge in so many ways legacy featherweight goat uh i mean there's just so many layers to this fight and on top of that it's a good fight man like yeah. both these guys are super exciting super durable super smart they have two of the smartest teams as well like once you're there dude they're not even playing chess anymore yeah. they're they're just like literally like in the matrix like this is like some <laughs> next level shit bro this is some next level shit there's shit that like I'm gonna see in that fight that I'm not gonna even catch. Right. Like th th they're so advanced out. that yeah, it's crazy. It's insane. I love watching like that high level and in any sport, right? Like yeah. Um, just thinking of what we saw between Steph and you know Steph and the, and the Golden State Warriors versus the Celtics and how they were defending certain ways, but like Steph is just so good. That it doesn't matter if you're hedging on screens above the the, the screener, he's just gonna hit shots. And he made you know time with Robert, Robert Williams look foolish like 13 times. He's one of the best defenders in the NBA. So like the ability for high elite goat level athletes to dictate certain things in their sport, Brady obviously being mm -hmm. able to see the play before the play before the play, and knowing what defenders are gonna do and all these different things. Like this is one of those fights that. You're gonna look back and say, "Holy shit!" Like almost like almost like the AFC Championship game with Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen, where it's just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and then yeah. they finally ended it in one of the best, you know, best games of all time. And like this has the opportunity to be that. Yeah, 100. percent And and I'll tell people this: if you want to look at, if you want to get a look of the most advanced technique, the most the, the highest level possible attainable today in 2022 in mixed martial arts watch that fight there's literally no other levels above that that is the very best the best practices the very best technique you're looking at the highest level of technique attainable today in that fight like there's no other example that i can give you of better technique i mean yeah it's like watching you know brady play it's like watching steph curry play this is it this is that main event time Israel Asanya, 22 and 1. Jared Cannonier, 15 and 5. Been on an absolute heater since he went down to middleweight. This is a big time fight. Yeah. What do you think about this? I, I just I have so many things to say and I'm just trying to clear my head. What do you think about you this? You know, I want to be I want to be respectful here because I want to give Cannonier his due, but like I, I've been so impressed with what Israel Asanya has been able to do, and he's just been dismantling people uh, at 185, of course, and making it look so easy that Jared Cannonier, I think he, he definitely poses a problem. He hits very, very hard, and with that amount of power, like you cannot, you know, you have to be perfect because one mistake might cost you the entire fight. But at the same time, it's like, dude. You're telling me that Jared Cannonier hits harder than Jan Blachowicz and, you know, Jan Blachowicz, you know, he was, I mean, he lost that fight, right? Israel Adesanya, but power-wise and striking-wise, he was able to deal with him. It was the wrestling that beat Israel Adesanya. Right. So, right. in my opinion, this is Israel Adesanya's fight to lose. Like, you know, he, he should win this. He should win this. I think that Jared Cannonier is such an interesting case study, right? Because he's a heavyweight. All of a sudden go you know what i'm not going light heavyweight i'm going one further down i'm going to fight as a middleweight and since he's made that move he's been a completely different fighter and the the ability for his power to translate so well right because usually when you lose that weight you lose the power that comes with it yep. all of a sudden he's shredded 
and he is dropping bombs. I mean, obviously, you saw what happened with Derek Brunson. Like, he is dropping absolute bombs. Like you said, Izzy is such a smart fighter and is such a sharp surgical fighter that he can stay at a distance and watch, you know, and try to see those those big shots coming and get in and out with jabs and with kicks and certain things. But like, I think Jared Cannonier, if it weren't for his for his Radasanya, would be middleweight champion. Yeah, he's facing one of again the best of all time, and we look at what what he's been able to do, Izzy, in just pure dominance in the middleweight division. It's like he's he's legitimately one of my favorite athletes to watch do anything. And my so when I started getting into UFC, my wife was like, "Hey, like this is kind of cool." She started falling in love with like Thug Rose, watching her fight, and all of a sudden Israel Asanya comes and she's like, "Who is that?" And she mm-hmm. just saw his, the way that he can cleanly go and like just how the, the fight moves so slow for him. And she fell in love. She's like, oh, my God, I want to see every fight with Izzy. And like I think that's the draw with Izzy is that you see such an elite level of striking, such an elite level of kickboxing. That you're like, oh, wow, hold on. They're like, this is it. Yeah, I mean, that you said it perfectly. Israel Adesanya's technique striking-wise is, is so beautiful. It's so high level. I mean, the guy's really translated his style from kickboxing very well into mixed martial arts. It's a beauty to watch. It's a beauty to watch because, yeah, he's got power. I'm not going to say he, he doesn't. I mean, the guy hits very, very hard. But most of his power really comes through precision, really comes through landing that perfect shot. I mean, he doesn't really have to wind up like maybe like a Jared Kennear and other, other people in that division, Paulo Costa, etc. Other names there. Like, he, he really just picks his, his spots. He's like basically like an Anderson Silva 2.0. Yeah. He, yeah. You know, I think that fight was also very important when they had it. You know, it was like sort of the passing of the torch. Um, he, he's this era's Anderson Silva. I mean, he's got that mystique, that magic around him that he, it almost he 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 has a spell and, and he has uh, some enchantment on the crowd, like the way he moves. Uh, there's something very, very special about that dude. And um, again, I don't want to look past Jared Cannonier, but. I just feel like this should be a very, not easy fight, but very manageable fight. Like, again, as long as he does his homework, as long as he trained properly, as, as long as he goes in there and takes this thing seriously, I think he should be able to walk away with the win. And he's one of those guys that's so mentally tough, too. And obviously, in every yeah. promo that they cut of Izzy, you see him mouthing, I'm ready to die in the yeah. cage, right? That famous shot of him saying, like, I'm ready to die or I'm willing to die or whatever it is. And- the, the, we talked about earlier about Sean O'Malley and how he's got all the tools to be a great fighter from the neck down, but does he have it from the neck up? And like we know Izzy has all the mental tools to become the fighter that he has become, right? Because there's been a bunch of guys that have been, oh, this guy's a great kickboxer. Oh, my God, he's a great wrestler. Oh, my God, he's, good. he's a great boxer. But nobody can kind of put it together with all of those things even though obviously he likes you know stuff on the ground, but that's a different story. The point being that his ability to go into a cage and say, you will not beat me. It doesn't matter what you're going to try. I'm going to beat you. That to me is like, there's, there's nothing better. I think, yeah, I, I, that's... I, think he, I think he comes out and defends his title. How many, how many title defenses are we at with his? Four, I think he's five? about five, maybe. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, Let me double check here. I think he's got like four or five times defenses, obviously, you know. Four, yeah, this will be his fifth. This will be five, okay. Mm-hmm. I, I I, just don't see anybody in the division beating him. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I don't either. Prisons, yeah. But I don't think anybody beats Izzy. I don't. I think, look, at this point, like there's so many styles, so many fighters that have tried, you know, to bring down and dethrone the champion and they've tried in so many different manners you got the striker you got somebody putting him pressure you got somebody striking and and looking to counter like costa did which turned out to be horrible um (laughs) then yeah it turned out to be so bad for him um and then you know you got someone like marvin vittori who brought like that wrestling that pressure against the cage look nothing nobody's been able to figure him out the only time that we've seen him lose was against Jan Blachowicz at 205 and really that was a fight that Israel Adesanya was winning I think size had a lot to do with it because once Jan Blachowicz started wrestling and putting you know Jan Blachowicz is basically a heavyweight that guy's huge once he started weighing on him that really costed Issy the fight but at 185 like 
I mean, you really got to ca- catch him in like an off night f- to beat him. And even that, I- is it enough, right? It's like Valentina Shevchenko. Like, she's really got to be off for you to like beat her. And if that, you know, y- is that even enough? So that fight, um, by the way, going backwards, going that, that fight was. Yeah. Who do you think won? By the way, she, she had a bunch of injuries, she, according to her. She did. Of yeah. course. I just, I, I remember, I'm trying to think of who it was. One of the judges had it 49 46. And I was like, Mm-hmm. Like that, dude. That, I don't. I don't. The know. judging has been hella sus lately. It has. Hella sus, bro. It has. I haven't seen such a long stretch of questionable decisions in a while. It's been was weird. There another one. I'm trying to think. Was there another one on that card that was questionable? Obviously, we can go to Thug. We can go to Thug Rose and we can go to Esparza. That was. That was weird. Yeah. That was a weird fight just from the beginning. But I know uh, it was. It was Shevchenko, and there was another fight on that card that I think went to the decision that I was like, eh. Maybe I can't remember off the top of my head, but but as of recent, like Holly Holm, uh, Ketlin Biera, yeah. Cater versus Emmett, um, there's been a, a few ones that, that have been kind of weird. You just talked to Emmett not too long ago, right? Yeah, yeah. I interviewed him uh, a few days ago. He's apparently going to be in attendance for USC 276. Dana got him tickets, so uh, that doesn't mean anything, but... I hope Dana can get him tickets, man. It's the least he can do. Yeah, right. Yeah, after he just shed blood in that octagon, yeah. you better get you better get some food too with it. Sight, Shit, you know? exactly. Yeah, who's who's the fighter that you haven't seen in a while that you were excited to see? That'll be the last question. I have I have an answer, and it's an obvious answer. But I'm on this card or just in general? No, 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 just in general. Jai Rodriguez, bro. Jai Rodriguez. Uh, he's fighting July sixteenth. And he's a guy that, if you look at his record, he barely fights, dude. He fights like once a year, if that. I'm going to pull his record up right now. But I talked to, and first of all, that guy is very mysterious. Like, good luck trying to catch an interview with Jair Rodriguez. He only does interviews because he has to right. on fight week. But other than that, the guy's very, very private. Um, but I've spoken to people that are very, very close to him. And uh, the guy doesn't fight that much because he his his game is so based around kicking that like he just kicks the hell out of people every single fight and his feet are so swollen up that it takes for him a long time to recover and he's just not able to fight as frequent as others um there's also he's also had some mental health issues in the past as well but i think he's all good on that but look he fought once in 2021 which was against max holloway that was late 2021 before that he fought once in 2019 in october um then once again in september in 2019 Sorry? That he took the pandemic year off. He's like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, basically. And and he fought twice in 2019. That's because the fight against Jeremy Steven, they did it twice because it was an accidental eye poke. It was literally yeah. a 15 second fight. I was there for that fight in Mexico. And then they rebooked it the following month. So it really counts as one. So he fought once in 2021, once in 2019, once in 2018, twice in 2017, twice in 2016, twice in 2015. Like the guy's just barely fights but he's so good i know the ufc really appreciates him he's huge in mexico um just a fun style i just literally he's got everything everything to be a star is just the activity level so hopefully with this uh fight against brian ortega and you know he fairly recently somewhat fought um max holloway hopefully this means you know more more yeah, frequency in his career just twice 1.5 times a year 1.5 times a year that's it doesn't even have to be twice like you know twice every 18 months and i'm happy bro um for me i think the answer is john jones right and oh yeah such an 100%. obvious answer that's why i said it's obvious. that's a great one i'm i'm really interested i know it was either going to be steep a or hmm, it was steeper or somebody else i can't remember in ghana in ghana yeah so if everything's all right with his knee slash contract so that's Again, that's another another story. TBD, yeah. But the fact that we haven't seen John in so long, and obviously his reputation has preceded him throughout his entire career, basically. Yeah. And it's interesting to me to see. I remember when he was going up against DC, and like I remember not liking DC. And a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, like I remember not liking DC and being like, oh, the suit, like, oh, what is he trying to do? Like, oh, wait, like kind of a big wrestler guy, like, ah, boring, I don't want to care, like, I don't care. And then it's funny how the tides have turned so far, right? Where now DC is Hall of Famer, lovable guy on every show everywhere, now on the broadcast for the UFC, and John Jones has just continued to 
don't want to say derail his life, but that's what he's done, right? Like, I mean, he's out there subtweeting. Uh, that's that's about it. That's his favorite. That's his, that's his thing. Yeah, his favorite out there taking shots on people on on Twitter and. Um, but yeah, that, that's a shame. And he turns 35 in July. So it's going to be two years since he hasn't fought. <sighs> Man, he's really one of the greatest talents we've ever seen. He's probably the GOAT. And uh, yeah, I'm with you. Like, I, I wish we could see him fight long. Like, huge. What's up? That for him to be back in the octagon would be huge. Oh, especially at heavyweight. Dude, if he's able to win a title at heavyweight, he's the GOAT. Yeah. He's the GOAT. I don't care about the tainted supplements. I don't care about the picograms. He is the GOAT. The cocaine. I mean, any of that can go out the window. I know GSP is like the perfect, you know, model citizen. But uh, at that point, like you win a title at light heavyweight, defend it forever, pretty much undefeated. Win a title at heavyweight. Sorry, GSP. After like taking it, two years off. Not after fighting, taking two years off, yep. Just training, whatever. Like his, that's that's one fight that I'm looking, whoever it's against, I don't care. Yeah. Who, but that's one that I'm really looking forward to. I'd also add to the list, Nate Diaz. I love Nate Diaz and Conor McGregor. When those guys are fighting, Paul, MMA is fun, dude. Nate Paul, Nate Diaz on a, on a card somewhere? Would you be interested? Boxing? You know what? I'd watch it. I, I covered Mayweather here in Miami at the Hard Rock Stadium. Uh, Mayweather, Logan Paul. Logan all right. Paul. So I've been at the bottom of the bottom, right? Um, <laughs> so I, I'd watch I'd watch Diaz, Jake Paul. I think that's a little better. Clearly, Jake is better than Logan. Uh, well, I wouldn't say Nate Diaz is better than Mayweather, but at least that fight would be more competitive, I think. And um, and look, I yeah, for the spectacle, I'd do it. Yeah, for sure, I'd cover that. I'm, I'm the last thing before I let you go. I'm I'm tired of people saying that it's a spectacle. It's not real combat sports. Get over yourself. There's it's fighting. Pure. Yeah, it, there's nothing pure in fighting. Nothing. Yeah. I don't care what it is. You put you put a grizzly bear versus an alligator. Like I'll watch it. I don't care. Dude, bro, I mean, there's like tons of stuff going on. Like, I don't know if you've seen that pillow fighting FC, uh, you know, <laughs> bare knuckle FC. Bare knuckle I mean, there's like so many variations of, of like fighting. Like, um, look, at the end of the day, this is price fighting. This is price fighting. So um, I don't want to see Nate Diaz get a fat bag. Uh, Jig Paul, I mean, he's already a millionaire, but um, yeah, it'd be fun. There you go. There you go. Shouts out to Palomino, bro, a Miami guy, Peruvian. On, uh, on the undisputed bare knuckle goat. Yeah, that dude's forty one too, bro. I don't know what they're putting in that ceviche, but he's looking I'm great. Here. I need some of that, bro. He's looking great. He's <laughs> looking great. He's got a great story too. I don't know if if you've uh, gotten a chance to like look at some of uh, the interviews. I've interviewed him a few times, but um, the guy was one of the best fighters in the world outside of the UFC, and the UFC wanted him, but he never got signed because he was an undocumented immigrant. He just became a resident wow. like two three years ago. And he's been talking about that openly, but it's crazy. He had a he he fought Justin Gagey twice while being like undocumented. Like, That's crazy. Um, it's crazy, man. That guy Where has a crazy life story. Because I, I know you've done that interview. Where can people check that out along with all the other stuff that they can check out? Yeah, so you can uh, go to MMAJunkie.com or go on their YouTube channel. You can find that interview as well. I also do Spanish content. You can find that on Hablemos MMA on YouTube. And uh, follow me on all socials as well, Danny Segura TV. He's Danny Segura. It's your boy Tende Tony. We're getting ready for UFC 276. Izzy versus Jared Cannonier. Again, my brother, thank you so much for hanging out, for giving the people what they want. And let's do 277, huh? For sure, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure being here with you. I mean, last time we saw each other, you know, we we're trying to become a journalist in, in, in sports. <laughs> and here we are talking about sports. You're a journalist. So it's, it's, I am not a journalist. It's I great. Am, well, reporters, media people, whatever you want to. Let's call, all right, media people, let's say that. <laughs> so uh, pleasure being here and uh, uh, lo love Dan Lebetard and, and the network, you know, always representing South Florida and That's I'm great. big on that as everyone in, in the community knows. So appreciate, appreciate the, the invitation. Thank you, brother.